Okay, guys, let's start our meeting. Find a seat. Find a seat. Okay. I want to welcome everyone to the June 9th, 2023 meeting of the New Jersey Antique Radio Club here at Princeton University Bowen Hall. I don't believe there are any new faces in the lecture hall, right? Just the same old craggly faces. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, did I insult anybody? No. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, infirmary report. I have nothing to report. Uh, is there anything I should know about? Anybody I should know about? All right, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, as you read in the communicator, Monday there will be a memorial service for a longtime member, Pete Grave. It's in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, and it will be at the Friends Meeting House, intersection of Mill Road and South Main Street at 12 noon. I understand there are some members who will be going. I will be attending. I try to attend most uh, wake situations with members. Um, it's going to be a little different, at least for me. I've never been to a Quaker event, so to speak. So it'll be interesting. Okay, uh, on to old business. The continuing saga of AM band radio in new automobiles. Your congressman, Josh Gothheimer, has been pushing for manufacturers to change their tune and keep an AM in all vehicles. And now other politicians are uh, pushing for it to the point where Ford promises an AM radio in all their vehicles at no extra for co cost either. How about that? Isn't that nice of them? Damn. Unbelievable. But at least that, that ball has really gone rolling. You know, just got going and going and going. And people realize how ridiculous it is. So, um, if they need an interview with somebody who knows something about AM radio and electric EVs and all that, Jonathan would be the man because they, the dissertation you would be giving on the communicator about the motors and what you have to do to silence the AM, the, the RF on it, it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's my racket. That's your racket, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So when uh, Channel 12 News comes uh, to, to interview, I'll give them your name. They'll, I'll say, it's your racket. You, you'll figure it out. All right. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, the evening of May 24th, I had the pleasure of presenting the first New Jersey Antique Radio Club Scholarship Award to Wall High School senior valedictorian Molly Matri. She is top of a class ranking one out of 249 students, right? With a GPA of 4.46. How does that happen, <laughs> Professor Mike? <clears throat> Isn't 4.00 it? No, no, no. <laughs> With endorsements. <laughs> With endorsements, I guess, yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, uh, Molly will be attending Cornell University in the fall, studying chemical and biomedical engineering. Uh, at the last minute, she changed from uh, Carnegie Mellon, and maybe because Cornell, uh, Cornell gave her a full boat, you know, probably. She certainly was capable of doing it. Uh, uh, please read my article in the, this month's broadcaster, and it goes into detail uh, in the essay that she wrote after her visiting the RTM. Okay, it's all in there. I'm not going to repeat it again and then again. Now, this is recurring, and we're going to do this as a club every year. Okay, <clears throat> and yes, the gift was a thousand dollars. It's substantial, but nowadays it's what, what, what it is, you know. One textbook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's right. There, yeah, because every campus has a Starbucks now, of course. Okay. All right. She's probably smart enough that uh, the college would give her a full scholarship anyway. Well, that's what I said, but maybe Carnegie Mellon wouldn't and Cornell would, so, you know. I met her mother, lovely lady, and uh, uh, her and her family have been to um, InfoAge many times, so they knew of it. Whereas when I was doing the presentation uh, at the uh, school, I got up on the podium, there was two and a half hours of award ceremony. Um, you know, like these seats are nice, okay? Those seats were not nice for two and a half hours. And I happened to make a 
a little comment about it when I was up there and uh, had a chuckle from the audience. And then when I got off the stage and we left, everybody's patting me on the back. Boy, I'm glad you said that because this was horrible. These seats are awful. <laughs> But a, a, great, a great bunch of kids, They're really nice kids, no jackasses or anything like that. And of course, I always said, you know, info age, 2.5 miles away from Wall Township High School. And people were saying, where is that? Where is that? I said, you people live here. <laughs> you don't know where it is. And that's always been the problem with info age. They just don't get it out to everybody. OK, all right. OK. Um, as we do every six months, your executive board meets via Zoom to plan and discuss club meetings and events. Uh, you see and will see soon those results in the Jersey Broadcaster uh, on our website and on our website. Okay. All right, one item we discussed and voted on was a big thank you to our RTM docents by offering them dinner at our holiday party in December, gratis. Okay. We want to thank our docents for what they do, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. And um, so uh, that's with your wife or your girlfriend, but not both. You're being interested party. All right. But, um, uh, you know, you guys you know, do a hell of a lot, and it's the least we can do, actually. All right, so... On to new business. All right, new business tomorrow. The Vintage Computer Federation, VCF, is having their technology swap meet in the large parking lot across from Brookdale ca uh, campus. It's $20 for vendors and $5 for buyers. They start at 8 a.m. till 2 p.m. Somehow I don't think people are going to be at there till 2 p.m. Bobby, you vending? I can't make it tomorrow. Okay. Anybody else vending? Anybody else going? Say, I'm um, Bobby, I didn't hear it. No, I said it's a pretty low event. We, we, my, uh, if we added a couple of people from the club there, that would be great. I can't make it. I, I have some that have to move on. Yeah, I was there, I think, twice. I went twice as a buyer, you know. Yeah, Ray was there as a vendor once. That's right, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is this being held? The, the giant parking lot just uh, would be north of uh, Brookdale campus. That would have been Camp Evans' main parking lot, I imagine, back then for civilians. Monmouth Boulevard. Yeah, Monmouth Boulevard. Monmouth Boulevard, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Okay, we are six weeks out from our annual Summer Hamfest tailgate swap meet on the grounds of InfoAge, and that will be July 22nd. Uh, so I'm taking reservations. I prefer email. Uh, if you give me a reservation tonight, just make sure you see me write it down. I'm old and I forget. Right. Uh, uh, ba, ba, ba. And uh, our July meeting will be a uh, asking for volunteers. Yes, John? Are we going to have a place for freebies for people who drop off free stuff by the admissions chamber? No. <laughs> you have to sell it. <laughs> no what? How about for a dollar? Yeah. Yeah. I'll find it. Give it a dollar and donate the money to the club. Thank you. Good, good idea, Jonathan. All right. All right. Any other new business? I do have some new business that just came up literally this afternoon. As you see outside, we have entered the 21st century with our trifold, okay? Now, uh, this is actually a preliminary. The printer, who happens to be a very good guy, okay, um, he couldn't get everything out in time. So he, he, he ran off quick 25 uh, brochures for us, so I have something to give out tonight, okay? Um, it's, it's been a lot of work, and, you know, one of the big parts goes to Al, Al Clays, who, uh, was, what was it, earn while you learn now? Something like that. Something like that, right. And uh, no, Dave? You, you should repeat my line because when I'm not a graphic artist, but I do play one on TV. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
And, uh, and I said that to the printer, and uh, he said, this guy did a great job. Uh, can I hire him? I said, so um, again, this is, um, well, it's pretty much, it's going to be a different paper, a little shinier, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the only disappointment I have with it is uh, on the, uh, you know, in the executive board, we vote on things. And I wanted, I thought it was only appropriate that I should have my picture on the front page. What's well, so agree. funny? Where New Jersey is, your face should go right there. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could arrange it. And, um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I was voted down, and the most vo vocal person about it vo was, was Dave Sika. And he was saying, you know, it's unethical, it's not right, uh, you know, you're going to look like a dictator, you're going to look like a benevolent, a, a benevolent <laughs> despot, you know. And I said, well, all right, all right. So, you know, you open up the trifold, and what do you see? A picture of Dave Sika right there. <laughs> Damn. Anyway, it's all in jest. We had fun. So uh, the next time you see me, I'll have the more glossy one, but it's fine. It's all, all the, you know, the texts and pictures are all the same. And what do we have? We have uh, Harry, who's not here tonight. Uh, he's with Pat Dillon, member Pat Dillon. And Dave uh, Sika is talking to Jerry and Gordo, and, and Tom Kittridge is in there. And um, then, of course, we have Ted, and we have uh, this wonderful ball spot of Neville, you know, <laughs> the back of his head. Chrome dome. <laughs> no, I'm the chrome dome. I'm the chrome dome. Hey, it's all about us. It's wonderful. With QR codes, too, guys. And they go places, too. So we, we entered the 21st century, thank goodness. Okay, so what's next? All right, all right. Hamshot Corner. Saturday, May twenty seventh, I attended the Bower Ham Fest at Westwood High School in Westwood, New Jersey, uh, along with other NGRC members. Good show. I picked up a Holocrafts SX one hundred one with the R forty eight speaker, uh, digital panel meters galore. They had a fellow that was selling them very inexpensively. And, and uh, I, I also picked up a, a Tenma uh, brand, a three-inch scope. That didn't work, but hey, that's how it goes. Anyway, and I, whenever I go to anything before our ham fest, I always give out flyers and, uh, and push our club uh, for uh, that ham fest. And of course, people say, where's InfoAge? I draw them a map, okay. Uh, in competition, tomorrow's VCF event, Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club, FLARC, is having their ham fest at the Fairlawn uh, Memorial Pool. And I wish, uh, I wish that uh, Fred was here. He could push it a little better, but he's there tonight setting up for it. So uh, what I gleaned from the um, website, it's uh, uh, $15 online for space, $20 at the gate, and $5 for buyers. Opens at 8 a.m. Uh, Limark. Uh, is um, having their annual summer outdoor ham fest in Bethpage, 99.9 Stewart Avenue, and that is uh, this Sunday at 7 a.m. And admission is $6. I will be there with a few members of our club, our, our Long Island contingent, uh, so I'll report to you about that. Uh, okay, Sunday, June 17th, Raritan Valley Radio Club is having their ham fest at Piscataway High School, 100 Bay Baymar Road, admission is $7. Uh, okay, I read a report in the ARRL letter that this year, Hamvention surpassed last year's attendance and the pre-pandemic year with 33,861 attendees. So it's growing. Good for them. I think that's great. Anybody in the room been there? Why? That makes sense. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, it's a bucket list for sure. Yeah. Well, people don't they go around with shopping carts or they it's do, all mud.
I know uh, Roberto Forte has been there He's a couple of times. He, he really crowed about it. He enjoyed it. Okay. Um, so it's good that, to see that's growing. Uh, any other uh, business, any old business, new business, or anything anybody wants to talk about? Because I'm well, done. Bring up field day. Oh, field day. I field remember day that. I remember that. The weekend of the 23rd, come, on, come on up. Come on up. Right. Come on up. So uh, weekend 23rd, 24th, uh, you know, calling all hands. Come on down to. Get close to me. The, come on down to the Info Age grounds, and we'll set up some antennas and some rigs and have a good time. We'll probably set up two transmitter setups the way we've done in the past. And uh, just get on the air. And if you want to really dive into it, we've got one rig that's kind of set up for some serious ops. And if you want to have a great time, bring some old iron, bring your own rig, set it up, have some fun with it. we got another setup for that. We'll be on generators and batteries and such. So, uh, Do you know what frequency you'll be using? 12 feet, you don't know. most likely four, 40 and 20 meters uh, will be the 7 and 14 megahertz, are the best ones. Although now that the sunspots are up, maybe we may get some better on 15 and 10. We shall see. We'll just play it out by whatever happens. You're so that's correct. July. Sorry. No. Oh, sorry. The end of June, the, the fourth weekend in June, is the official Field Day weekend. So it's. So, so we're, we're not doing I'm, Sunday morning. Uh, we're we're doing. It starts at 2 p.m. Saturday to right to 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 that to 2 p.m. Sunday. Friday setup. Friday setup. Yes, we'll get this all out on the communicator. We'll also have to work out some details about eats because, uh, unfortunately, the situation changed a little bit, and we we uh, won't have uh, Ted's fabulous uh, wife cooking. Unfortunately, she's occupied with another another subject that day. So, anyway, we'll work it all out. She, yes, sir. She's working, unfortunately. Yeah. She can't. Field day used to give bonus points to the people who powered their rigs with solar power. Yes, yes. I, I'm going to be bringing a panel and two large batteries. Okay. One way to get rid of RFI. <laughs> we shall see. Okay, so okay, come on out. You. Oh, thank you, Neville. Ted, you want to say something? Ted, Ted, you want to say something? Come on up here. Do you need operators? Yes, that's what I wanted to ask about. Uh, a lot of people think, um, you know, field day is maybe like too difficult or you have to have some kind of a special skill for it. You don't. Basically, what field day is, is run like a contest, but it's not a contest. What it wants is participation. What we're showing is, as a group, our ability to operate in a field setting and keep communications going for X amount of time. Along with that comes obviously some points that you get for the various places that you contact and what have you. Now, um, I will warn you, when you sit in that chair and you get going with it, it gets addictive. It starts to become fun. And if you're not sure how, don't worry about it. As long as you just don't sit and do absolutely nothing at all, you're fine. So you don't well, that's it. You just all you have to do is just say CQ field day, and somebody will come back to you. You just write down, uh, you know, who you got, and it goes into the computer system, and you move on to the next person. With the fabulous antenna that Dr. Neville made for us, uh, that thing is up about 40 feet, and it's an absolute howitzer. We hold any frequency we choose, so that's kind of nice. And as Neville uh, reiterated, we have uh, Al's crew down uh, down the field a little bit. It has a little bit more um, flexible setup for interchanging rigs, a little bit of a slower pace. Nev and I usually kind of go a little bit quick in the beginning when all the forays going on and then it settles down. But we are by no means chair hogs. We would love to get up and let you sit and operate and uh, bring you soda and ice water and food or whatever you want. That's how, that's how it goes. You know? So this year, unfortunately, my wife is a general manager of a uh, grocery, a small grocery store now, and she can't get the time away. She's a bit disappointed because she likes to cook for you guys. But look at it this way. We have a building. We have running water. We have a coffee maker. We have microwave, bathrooms. We can work this out. And there's also plenty of places. Uh, yes? I'm going to make my first CQ. Cool. There you go. There you go. 
So that's, that's really it. I, I would love to see a lot of the membership come down and enjoy themselves. You don't have to operate 24-7 or anything, but it would be nice to uh, maybe stage it a little bit. It's like somebody who like, is a bit of a night owl, right? Just hang out at the station down below a, uh, for a while and keep that one going. Or somebody who likes to work uh, or is an early morning bird type person. There's morning operation hours. There's, there's plenty of pl a room for any and all to operate as much as they want. And uh, we'd be more than happy to have you. And uh, as, as a, you know, as a club activity, there's a lot, you know, you hang out with people that you don't see all the time and, and it's, it's part field day, part social event. And you can always bring down uh, some, some extra goodies and stuff and we can share meals and so on and so forth. That's about it. So come on down, like Nev said, bring your own rig, whatever you want to do. And uh, we will do our best to accommodate you. All right, thank, thank you, you, Ted. Yeah. How many operators do we have in the room right now? <clears throat> Hands. And you don't need a ham license. We're under club call. Right. Okay. You don't have to have no license whatsoever. That's uh, interesting. I forgot about that, yeah. That's right. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, good. Uh, we'll work out something with the food, all right? You know, the club and all, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll talk about it. Uh, because that was back and forth with your wife, and I understand. Okay. Um, all right. We need a short, short intermission, and we're going to be selling 50-50 tickets, so therefore we need help, help, help with the sale of 50-50 tickets. Who can help with the 50-50 tickets? Crickets. Paul? Oh, look at that. A, a docent and a docent. How about that? See? Look at that. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Make it short, guys. We got uh, a long night ahead of us with show and tell, hints and kinks.
All right, I'm going to go first only because I'm right here. Yeah. Oh, Bill, here's your ticket. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh, John was right. It was here. I didn't assume. Anyway, guys, all right. This is the story. Okay. I collect 1939 World's Fair memorabilia. As you guys go around, we all go around, yard sale, whatever. I saw this, caught my eye. I said, oh, wow, look at this, a gigantic book full of memorabilia from the 39 World's Fair. Well, it's not, but it has a wonderful cover. It's gorgeous, for me anyway. So I open it up, and what do I see? Between 19, um, yes, 19, April 8th, 1939, and December 31st, 1939, is a day-to-day -day newspaper copies, morning edition, afternoon edition, evening edition, there was a time when that happened, of mostly New York City uh, newspapers having to do with World War II. And absolutely amazing. This one I've marked because it has to do with September 2nd, all right, 1939, okay? And of course, that's the start of World War II. So, you know, I've read through this and it's just fascinating to see it day by day by day and to see things building. And of course, you know, the idea, nobody knew what was going on. People knew what was going on. Believe me, they know. You know? So, um, anybody like to borrow it? They're very welcome to it. Um, you know, it's kind of falling apart, but it's, it's, uh, I've had it for a while, and, you know, people see it, and they look, oh, wow, I didn't look, yeah, well, look, there it is, you know, lift arm bands, you know, main Nazi army moves, I'm sorry, what? Where did you get this? Yard sale. Wow. Hmm. So, and it's, it came from somewhere in New York. Uh, I don't know if it was near me or it was in Long Island, but, you know, just amazing stuff, you know, somebody put it together. It's, it's uh, April 8th, 1939, to, uh, December 31st, eight, 1939. It's, you know, the war, but, huh? Yeah, almost a whole year. Yeah, daily, yeah. They, yeah, it sure is, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, do you have any way to scan that, Rich? Preserve it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm sure, you can, yeah, I'm sure you can find probably all of it someplace, but, you know. Jerry will do it. Jerry, that's right. Jerry will do it. The main, Jerry, you mind? You want to scan all this, Jerry? Rich, um, I noticed that one headline, which was great, by the way, was that was the Daily Mirror or the New York Mirror. Yeah. What other papers, just curious, what papers are in there? Are uh, Brooklyn Eagle, okay. Daily News. Post. Um, I don't know if I saw the New York Times in there, because it was more picture. Pay. New York Times certainly at that time didn't have many pictures. Uh, some more of the tabloids. You know? um, I probably don't know all of them. You know, I don't remember all of them. But uh, they don't exist anymore. I think. Uh, well, Daily News, New York Post does. But I remember the Brooklyn Eagle. I'm from Brooklyn, and I remember that. You know, the Telegram. There was this called the Telegram. Brooklyn Telegram. Yeah, yeah. World Telegram. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were you were a newspaper man, John, so you know. In the industry, yes. In the industry. Yes, in the industry. Right. Herald Tribune. Herald Tribune. Yeah, yeah. You're a paper boy. But just think, there was an evening, there was an evening edition and a afternoon edition, so there were, a lot of people were put to work. It's great. And now, no newspapers, basically. Okay. Okay. So anyway, that's enough from me. Anybody want to borrow it? They're welcome to it. This is a topic which is going to make a lot of us hams grumble because uh, for many years there's been interest in the field of radio frequency about just how much RF which uh, one should ever expose. Yeah, good. Thank you for yawning. Perfect. <laughs> if you're not a ham, you can go to sleep. I'll wake you up at the end. So there's been interest in limiting the amount of RF which folks are exposed to in the course of their jobs or even their home life. 
And for many, many years, ham radio had an exception to all this, that we're kind of low power and we're just intermittent, we're in our backyards. But two years ago, the FCC said, nah, you know, you better uh, start uh, getting after those hams. So they said that we should do some kind of a survey to show that we're not irradiating our neighbors or killing our dogs with our transmitters. So uh, they put a date line on it of, it was just this May, we were supposed to have something done about our antenna structures and our transmitters. So sometime around the 1980s, the IEEE, which is the electronic uh, equivalent of uh, a, uh, basically a technical club, but they have quite a bit of clout in the industry, established some recommendations for the amount of RF radiation that got allowed to put onto a person from transmitters like television, and radio transmitters and other sources. And this is where the FCC gave us an exemption as hams. However, in 2021, they decided to remove that exemption and place us under the same restrictions that exist for everybody with a serious commercial transmitter in the many, many kilowatts. And we were given a couple of years to make some kind of a performance guess on our antennas that we weren't gonna, as they say, do in the neighbors and kill the dogs. So. What to do about it? Well, you know, all right, the FCC is not going to come knocking on your door unless your neighbor complains about massive headaches every November when the sweepstakes comes around and you're running a Henry 3K export model with a 90 pound transformer in it. So uh, if they don't complain, well, all right, it's a piece of paper. Where did this all come from? Well, there's no credible form of research yet that shows any serious health effects from low levels of radio frequency exposure. Yes, there are crackpots out there. Yes, there are extremists out there, but there's no credible, double-blind, seriously done studies that show any effects other than simple heating. So many years ago, the IEEE flipped the coin and said, well, let's call it one-tenth of what you'd get standing out in the sun. That's not gonna upset things, you know? That's about the same thing as taking your shirt off, so. Uh, they have set that up as roughly a standard. And then they also put an allowance for a person standing on a ground as a bit of an antenna being a bit of a resonant structure since we're made of, what, 97% water or something like this. So we're, we're kind of like antennas standing on our feet. So this gave rise to a curve, which this is an interesting curve. You see it everywhere in everybody's republication of this subject. And basically it starts out at very high powers at low frequencies, has a little corner there go headed uh, towards being more restrictive starting at our 80 meter ham band, gee, I wonder why, and uh, ends out here at the lowest amount of allowed uh, ir irradiation at 30 megahertz. Gee, I wonder where that came from. Well, you know, that's kind of the upper end of our HF band. Then there's a flat region, which is kind of where you and I standing on ground uh, is kind of a resonant antenna where we might absorb the most out of all this. And that exists between roughly 30 and roughly 300 megahertz. And then you're allowed to blast everybody as a microwave oven if you go up a couple, couple gigahertz in frequency. So we are all required as ham radio operators to survey our antenna structures and our transmitters, our power and our modulation methods by 3rd of May this year. Now, luckily, it's a simple thing to do because it can be reduced to a series of equations, which I'm not going to try to even think of here. However, the ADAR-RL has made it quite simple to give you a set of calculators which will tell you how close can you safely get to your antenna with the key down and the transmitter running. So if you go off to www.arrl.org, and pop something like RF exposure in the search box up there in the top, that will take you to a list of a couple of topics which you can tell you all about this. And the second one, at least this afternoon, was how to do a calculation. So when you bring that page up, it's going to ask you for a couple things about your station. The power level you're running, the kind of modulation you're running, whether it's FM, AM, digital, single sideband, CW, single sideband with a heavy compressor on it, et cetera, and kind of how often your transmitter is on versus your listening. And you throw some of those estimates in along with a, a guess about your antenna gain where 
I threw in a three as a dipole there. And this particular result is for 80 meters, 1500 watts, heavily compressor, a third on time yakking on the air and a third time listening. And if you poke the bottom called calculate, it'll tell you kind of the safety level of your antenna. And if you look down there a little bit, you'll see two sets of numbers. One is for you, you and your ham station, which is called a, a, a controlled environment. And then an uncontrolled environment is for the general public, which could be like your neighbors. So for you and your station there, it looks like yeah, you can get within roughly uh, you know, two feet from the antenna without getting, any, getting up over the allowed radiation limits. And your neighbor, all right, unless you put your antenna right along the fence line, you're not going to bother your neighbor at roughly uh, three foot away or so, something like that. And print the results, stick it in the back of your logbook. Hopefully the FCC will never come asking for it. Well, we know they won't. But, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those unfortunate uh, things that seem to be popular in government these days of more and more paperwork, and this is just more of it. Anyway, try it again for 30 megahertz. Remember that curve came down to a fairly low level of RF exposure at 30 megahertz. So you repeat the thing for 10 meters. And oh, now it's getting a little close. You know, you got to talk about being kind of 15 feet away from your kilowatt and a half antenna at 30 megahertz. And your neighbor, you know, maybe you better keep that antenna kind of like, you know, a couple 20 feet away from his yard, you know. Uh, but once again, print the results, stick in the back of your logbook, and uh, just keep it there in case someone ever asks, which, well, let's face it, you won't. Okay, so what is this thing? This is how official real surveys are done. This is an instrument that costs about five rigs worth of value, and it will measure the actual radiated field impinged upon this cone, or this device, uh, antenna pickup on the end. And I borrowed this from my work. Obviously, I'm not going to buy one. But uh, this is what I do at Princeton Plasma Physics is one of the many things. But anyway, I found for my particularly bad antenna that I could get up to about a couple inches away at 30 megahertz with 100 watts. And I was only up to about one third of that allowed radiation standard. I'm not sure exactly why it does this, but it's an inverted V and the ends are fairly close to the ground and maybe we're just heating up the earthworms instead of getting out on the air. Who knows? But in any case, the take up on this is if you meet the, the uh, specifications of what you find from the online calculators, you're going to be way in line if anyone ever shows up with a real meter and actually tries to say, you're actually in violation. Well, it's not going to happen. But anyway. However, don't forget about a couple other things, like your feed line. This is my open wire feed line that goes up a pole about 25 feet and feeds that dipole off the back of my house. So I got to thinking, well, you know, I could stand on the edge of my uh, little deck there and get maybe within a foot of that. So I made that measurement too. And you can see no hassles there at 100 watts, even though I do have a Henry 3K with the international transformer in it. Anyway, what I did find was a leaky antenna tuner. It has a cover on the top. It has a gap. You know, you don't screw the cover down everywhere. I didn't. I should have. So I'm going to fix that because that's when that's where the that's only this way far away from me. And I found that's what's actually doing all the radiation in my shack. So there you go. We have to do it and it won't take too long. It's all online and it gets you out of trouble if the FCC ever comes knocking. Yeah, this is an interesting story about this radio. Some radios have sentimental value. And this radio I picked up when I visited my dad in Latvia, because he grew up in Latvia, and he moved back to the United, he came to the United States after World War II. And then towards the end of his life, he moved back to Latvia, and he actually became a, a warden of the US Embassy there. And, uh, when I came to visit him, uh, he took me, he knew I was interested in radios, he took me to a radio shop, and uh, that fellow gave me this radio plus some, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, European tubes. But what's interesting about this uh, radio, it's, uh, it's a Soviet era radio, and uh, on the front of it, it has Peter the Great on horseback, and he was the, one of the, uh, Tsars that actually developed the Russian uh, Navy back in ancient history. 
And some people probably notice that there's a knob missing here. And uh, I, well, I had all the knobs, but I, I was bringing it out of the garage. One of them fell, down, fell off and it rolled underneath the shelf and I was a little bit in a hurry, so hopefully I can find it again. And uh, the other interesting thing about this radio uh, is the frequencies that it actually operates on. And uh, the, the top frequency says Sredni uh, Volne, and then on the bottom it says Dinli Volne. Anybody know what that means? Well, all right. Kilo but kilocycles, megacycles? Well, actually, th this is all in meters. It's wavelength. Right, all in wavelengths. And uh, the top one is basically your AM band. Okay? And on the bottom one is your long wave band that actually, uh, let's see, what the, it goes from like uh, 200 meters to, uh, no, 800 meters to 2,000 meters. And uh, one thing that I, about the uh, long wave is that it propagates uh, and ground effect on, on, on the ground waves. So if, uh, if you have a mountain or something in the way, it'll kind of refract and go around it. So it's uh, good for long-term communications where you could probably get like 11,000, uh, no, 1,100 miles of uh, range on a radio transmitter. Uh, and a lot of these radio transmitters are found in Asia and uh, Africa and so forth. And now they're becoming obsolete because of, you know, I guess because of the technology and the popularity of them. And uh, on the back, it also has uh, a cover on here. And it also has a phonograph input where you can actually hook a phonograph to it. And it also has a 127-volt uh, and 220-volt uh, plugs that you can change. To, uh, and I thought most of the uh, voltages there were 220, but I, perhaps maybe they're not. And I believe this is, uh, has a, a transformer in it because all the tubes are uh, six-something. Uh, it's made in the, in the Soviet Union, and uh, Latvia used to be part of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, and then uh, when uh, Reagan had, you know, take down the wall statement, that's when it kind of fell down, and Latvia became its own country. And what year? Uh, I'm not sure what year this radio is, but it's, you know, in the Soviet era. It's post-war. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? That's a metal cabinet? Yeah, that's a metal cabinet, and inside... It's like a, a stamped steel, and inside where the chassis is, they have like pieces of cardboard to insulate it from the chassis of the radio. So that's their isolation, hmm. and it looks like just paper. So, yes. Do you intend on leaving it unrestored? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, uh, it's missing one tube, so uh, if I have a tube for it, maybe I try to fire it up. But uh, it'd be interesting to see if there's any activity in the uh, low bin. Uh, let's see how many tubes are there. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Looks like four, four tubes in here. Very schematic available. Uh, you know, I looked online to find a schematic, and I didn't find too much of anything on this radio. Yeah. But when you do crank it up, bury it up, to be sure you don't fry any capacitors. Yeah, because I had to go all the way to Soviet Russia to get the parts. No, <laughs> no Joseph Stalin on the dial? No, I, I was surprised about that, you know. Uh, you didn't mention the full finish on it. To, it's, it's really good. Yeah, it's like a printed finish or a painted finish. It's got a little bit of rust on top. And, uh, I, I immediately thought it was uh, plastic. Yeah. 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 The phono input, I assume, is not an RCA connector. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 I think it's a Nikita Khrushchev plug. <laughs> But yeah, it's like the European plugs with the Bakelite with the pins and the, yeah. yeah. Do you know the, the maker's name, Leo? What's, like, it, what's AP3 mean? Well, I think that's the model of the radio. Okay. And there's some Russian ri writing in there. My Russian isn't all that good. It would take me a while to decipher it. But, uh, okay, anybody else? Thank you. How many, I want to show a show of hands. Has anybody ever gone to their PC and Googled yourself just to see what would come up? Sure. Show of hands. Yeah. So just about, just about everybody in the room. There's a couple yes. people that didn't. All right, so in reading the email that Rich sent out that what was going to be happening tonight was he said, made the suggestion, well, bring your Cutstown stuff down here. And I'm like, 
Well, I can't really do that because I already did a video on my YouTube channel on that. So what I did tonight was I brought something here that's wrapped up in this hermetically sealed towel. <laughs> from that was um, lightly used, lightly used, but it's clean. We washed it. You know, it doesn't smell or anything. Okay. And um, this is actually from Parsippany. Now, most of you know Jarrett Brown, who is the president of DVHRC. Dave, you've never met the guy, but he's a really good guy. All right. So he, he, he walks by my table and he says, well, I wanted to give this to you. And I'm looking at this thing. I don't know how well it's going to come through. Where's the direction of the camera? Now, I, in Google, my own name, I know that there's a senator, Bob Bennett. And then I remember seeing, vaguely remembering this cat. This guy's also Bob Bennett, who made a record album. And apparently, he's a Christian artist who plays guitar and sings. Is Tony Brothers? So, so Jared. No. 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 I wish I was. I have with money. <laughs> But this is, this, so, so Jerry gave me a second. I thought you might enjoy this if for no other reason it has your name on it. So I thought that was kind of nice that he thought of me when he saw this record, because I'm sure to Jared this was probably fairly useless. But I haven't, I have not actually dropped this, dropped the stylus on her to hear what it says. But I know that this guy's a singer. He's a few years older than me, too. So I figured I'd just bring this here for fun. So it actually is my name, but it's not me. Okay, friends, um, as you probably know, I do industrial RF. And uh, we have, in industrial RF, you often have a, <clears throat> an interesting problem that you don't with transmitting signals. If you want to know the impedance of your antenna, so you can design a matching network, very simply, just to put an impedance bridge on the uh, feed line to the antenna, and you tune it, and you feel, oh, oh, 80 ohms uh, uh, with a reactance of this much and that much. Well, the problem with, with uh, igniting an RF plasma is that the impedance changes radically when it lights. How do you determine the impedance of the lit plasma? Well, you take a matching network, you tune it up, and tune, 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 tune to uh, zero reflected power, and you, then you turn it off. Well, you can get a rough idea of the impedance by feeding, uh, by putting a 50 ohm resistor on the input jack of the uh, of, uh, of the matching network, and then looking at the impedance on the out on the output and the outside and the inverse sign of the reactive component, you know, these usual formulas. But that does not account for dissipative elements that might be in the matching network. So what you want to do is simulate your uh, your impedance of this unknown load. And this is a circuit that can do it. It has a variable inductor, variable capacitor, and you can boost the capacitor with additional trimmers. And it has a variable resistance. And you can switch from a different a 50 ohm and a, a 20 ohm and a 50 ohm carbon pot, not wire wound. Um, and you have, of course, a, uh, a roller coil. And you just connect this to, to, uh, to your matching network output and tune until the input of the matching network looks like 50 ohms and 50 ohms non-reactive. And then you can measure the impedance of this thing, and it's going to be identical to your unknown load. It's built on a wooden chassis um, with regular radio parts. This over here is, a, is another test circuit, but the interesting thing about it is that the coil, so this, is, this is supposed to be a sort of a how-to show also, this coil, anyone want to guess what this coil form is made of? Porcelain. An olive. Toilet paper roll. Bamboo. 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 <laughs> Regular native New Jersey bamboozle. Uh, and the nice thing about bamboo is that it's for free. You've got to dry it, of course, you want, because you want to send radio signals, not smoke signals. And, uh, and it, you can just put a brass screw in it and solder to the brass screw. It resists the soldering temperature, mm -hmm. unlike, say, polystyrene. It's low loss all the way up, at least I know, to S-band. I found that out because I had some crackers that needed to be dried out in the microwave oven. I put them in a bamboo basket, zapped it, and the, the crackers got nice and hot and dried up. The basket didn't warm up a bit. So uh, that was my conclusion. So 
Another nice thing about bamboo is when you decide to, uh, after you wind your wires, by the way, these were wound by taking a double a piece of wire and a piece of string of a comparable width and winding by filer, so you get this, a space between the, the turns, which is approximately equal to the thickness of the turns themselves. Uh, and you can then shellac it or varnish it, and it sticks to the, to the bamboo and makes a nice connection. And then it's on a wooden chassis, you've got a variable capacitor, and now you've got your tuned circuit. And the final little gadget is to snoop for RF leaks. <laughs> Uh, we were talking a little while ago, a couple of you, about the, uh, the uh, electric automobiles where the, uh, the pulse width modulation uh, just pollutes the ether unbelievably so they can't even put an AM radio on board. Uh, well, in, in industrial RF, you also don't want to pollute the ether, not just because the FCC gets ticked off at you, but also because it gets into other control circuits and stops things from working properly. So. Um, and I suppose you don't want to over, overexpose yourself to it. I remember one time I was at a, uh, at, a uh, at the um, uh, shot, the company that handles uh, my uh, my cell phone business, and I had my cell phone there, and I was I, I was waiting in line. It was getting a little long, so I called my wife, and the guy said, "Oh, if you." Be careful of the radiation from that phone. It's going to cause your nuts to fall off or some crap like that. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, look, buddy, just yesterday I was running a 3,000-watt vacuum tube RF generator with Let's an... Let's measure it. Yeah. With a... <laughs> A 3,000 watt RF generator with unshielded matching network. Do you really think I'm going to crap my pants over a cell phone? <laughs> anyway, this is this is a, a, a little. A, I, I built this a little um, wave meter. You got the the resonant coil, the coupling coil that feeds to the meter, uh, diodes there to rectify to the to the little miniature panel meter. You can tune it. And there's an attenuator, so you can keep the range on on the range of the meter, and it all it's all made out of wood and little bits of porcelain insulators from a World War II radio transmitter, and that's and that, that's about it. So this is this is how you can avoid spending a. It's good to see the pros hack things together. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's fun and it saves you a lot of dough. Yeah. How long ago did you make them? Uh, a few years. Within the last few years. Yeah. So that's my stuff. <laughs> Thank you. have two really quick things here. Uh, one is a tiny box and one is two minutes long. Um, okay, so you may or may not have heard it was a famous uh, uh, wrist television, the Seiko uh, wrist television. This is not it. Uh, got, got this uh, uh, relatively recently, it fell into my lap. Uh, this is the NHJ wearable TV, which uh, I had never heard of. And I'll wager that you had never heard of it either. But it looks like somebody's idea of a, uh, a knockoff of a Seiko wrist TV. So it, it looks fairly Dick Tracy-ish, except, of course, you have all this other stuff that's required to make it work, <laughs> including this gigantic wristband, the actual circuitry, which <laughs> receives the signals that, of course, aren't there anymore to receive. But um, it looks relatively unused, which I'm not surprised at, because I'm going to guess that not too, well, wait, hold on. Even, even, if you're, even if you're a geek, you're not going to really uh, run around like, oh, yeah, it's time for uh, as the world turns here. Yeah, OK. So um, yeah, and I, I have no idea if it works, unfortunately. Um, but uh, what's the era? What's, uh, what do you think? This would be, this would be like 80s. Um, th this was, um, this was at the, it's, it's color, actually. So I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, have, I have a couple of the little, uh, the, remember the little handheld LCD TVs that had, a, I don't know what it was, like a 16 by 16 pixel screen? I don't know, maybe it was a little better than that. But uh, this, this has a, a tiny little screen in here, but it actually, uh, you know, supposedly puts out a color picture. Hey, CRT? This is an LCD. Yes. This is a this is a relatively early, uh, relatively low resolution LCD. But at least if you look at the picture on the box, it looks damn near HD. I'm telling you, that picture looks really good. And I'm going to guess that the actual picture doesn't look anything like that uh, picture on the box. But anyway. Um, it does not. But that's actually not a bad idea. That might have been an optional, optional accessory. 
Um, you could, you, you could probably, uh, yeah, you can, you can have a trailing wire antenna for that. Uh, the uh, actually, with most of the most of these little portable TVs, they use the uh, the antenna was built into the uh, the headphones, and I'm going to guess that this is probably a similar setup. Anyway, uh, okay, so that's that. You can take a look at that if you want. You can wear it if you like. Um, it's a uh, it's a weird little thing, and maybe someday I'll. I'll uh, set myself up with, with a uh, transmitter and take a look and see what kind of picture it gets. It's a converter, which will convert from digital TV format to NTSC. Yep, yep. I think we, we all got the little coupons for that, and we probably all have one of those in our house. Uh, Is there a massive VCR for that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it goes, it's a, that goes in the fanny pack, I think. All right, so... Now, the other thing I, I want to show you, I have a, a, a two-minute long uh, video here. Has anybody been on an InfoAge website lately? No, of course not. Hmm? Yeah. Um, okay, so th th there's a, a quick backstory here. Um, the, um, quite a number of years ago, I, I belong to a, um, uh, a video uh, production uh, group, a professional, uh, a professional development done. group. Excuse me? You got it done. Yes. Um, and the, um, we had, we had a, a, every year we have a, a fun end of the year meeting as opposed to a professional development meeting. And one year, quite a while ago now, we had, a, uh, we had that meeting at InfoAge. And everybody was just blown away by it. And we had the meeting in the, uh, in the RTM, and everybody went around to the, you know, the, the different parts of the campus and took a peek at things. And, we're, and they talked about it for years and years and years. The other thing that we do is every once in a while, um, well, it, let me back up. I've been doing, I've done a number of video projects for, uh, for InfoAge over the years. Um, but the interesting thing would be, what if you had unlimited resources, which I do not, and unlimited talent, which again, I do not. Um, so every once in a while, we do a, a public service project, and I proposed that we do a, uh, a promotional video for InfoAge because we, we never really had one. And everybody said, yeah, that's great, we love InfoAge, we think it's fantastic. So we, it, it took a long time, it was, it was very difficult. I found out, uh, I, it was professional development for me because I found out that I really suck at managing a, a large group of volunteers. But we had a, um, uh, we had close to, uh, we had camera crews, we had um, not professional actors, but we had a, a woman from the local theater group who brought in a whole bunch of kids who were used to uh, acting in front of the camera, used to taking direction. We had graphics people, we had sound people, uh, you know, Emmy Award winning sound people. back in time to explore the beginnings of the digital revolution at the InfoAge Science and History Museums, a place where discovery, resourcefulness, and serendipity have collided to spawn innovative technologies that have changed the world. The unfolding story that begins here starts with Marconi and the first wireless telegraph transmissions and picks up momentum rapidly with broadcast, radio and television, computers, and satellite communications, all leading to today's mobile devices that fit in the palm of your hand. Intertwined with technology is United States history, its trajectory influenced by these innovations. This is a living history museum, honoring those who have served in the defense and preservation of our country. And it's so much more. InfoAge is not one museum, but rather a cluster of over a dozen discrete collections designed for curiosity seekers of all ages. Located at a former U.S. Army base, Camp Evans, a U.S. National Historic Landmark in Wall Township, the buildings themselves are extraordinary artifacts you can walk through. Hands-on learning starts here. Descend into the depths of an actual fallout shelter. Bounce your voice off the moon. CQ from the InfoAge Space Exploration Center. Tour an actual Buckminster Fuller Dymaxion deployment unit. Hear actual news reports from the front. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin. There is so much to experience. InfoAge Science and History Museums. Revisit the past to inspire the future. Smart starts here. Oh, wait.
Dziękuję Ci. So, that was a lot of fun. I think it made us look good. Let's see. So we all heard about the um, Ford with the AM radio, right? <laughs> so this is an AM radio with a Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and, and it works. And I will confess, I've picked this up at the flea market, uh, the Golden Nugget flea market in Lambertville. Uh, and it took me too long to figure out how to get a battery into it. Um, I figured, you know, it, it does have a speaker and it has all of the right parts. And after playing with it for a while, I realized that if you turn the, uh, the crank for cranking over the engine, if you unscrew it, the hood comes off and that you can put a battery in it. So that took, that took me entirely too long. So that's one novelty radio. Yeah, it was really pretty cool. It was, it was only 25 bucks. It wasn't too bad. And I, I didn't bargain with the guy. I thought it was worth it. Uh, then I was in Florence uh, in January. Um, and I decided, I always, when I travel, I always try to look and see if I can have a souvenir. Um, sometimes you get all sorts of cool things. There weren't too many radios in Florence. There was a lot of naked statues. <laughs> uh, but I did find one antique shop uh, not too far from the Duomo. And so they had a lot of these miniature radios in the window. And I picked up one that I thought was really cool. And it's, the radio, it's, a, it's a replica of the radio Cubo. This is oh, yeah. the, these, and it was outrageously expensive. But it's really kind of cool. So the Radio Cubo, I think, was in the 50s or 60s? Yeah, in the 50s. It's a museum of modern art. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really cool, and it works. Cars in stock and available for a Really, delivery. really well, well, even in this room. It's in I'm sorry? It's in English. It's not in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> you were cheated. You were. Well, it says... AM or FM band? It's AM and, and FM. So that's uh, it's really cool. Uh, it's... Uh, you know, it's a novelty radio, and as I said, it was uh, um, amazingly expensive. <laughs> so that was, those are my two novelty radios. Okay, that's it. I got one quick one. I went to the uh, photo expo uh, this morning, and I uh, oh, hope my wife's not watching. This was sitting on the scratch and dent shelf for uh, a mere, he had 25 bucks on it, and I did bargain with him. I said, oh, I don't know if this works. Uh, how about 20? This guy goes, yeah, we could do 20 on it. Turns out it's a, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a real big Fuji fan. This is a Finepix S9000, and the only reason why I grabbed it is I heard a lot of uh, back and forth about the Super CCD sensor. So I said, okay, I got to have it. And I, had, I happened to have batteries with me because I'm at the photo expo and I shoot vintage. So the guy goes, well, if you had batteries, you could test it out. I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> so it's working fine and I got to figure out how to work it. But now on to, uh, and we can use this to take photos of radios, by the way. <laughs> this guy right here is a um, Sanjian ATS-818CS for cassette deck. The cassette deck is almost fully operational. It has one original band and one rubber band, but the proper cassette bands have come in the mail. I need to remove both circuit boards to get out the drums, and uh, that's not fun. However, uh, I did get this brand new off of eBay a long time ago. Somebody won it as a door prize and sold it off cheap. I forget how much these things went for, but they went for quite a few dollars. Lo and behold, when I found the radio, these have been missing arguably for 20 years, maybe slightly less, but right around there. This BFO knob was hanging out of the cabinet, and I figured, oh. But it, when you twirled it, it, it worked. It didn't, it didn't work in radio, but it, was, it, it felt like it was working. So I said, okay, it's not broke broke. It probably just came loose from the, the screws were loose. It must have screws in there, right? So I took it all apart. It don't have no screws. It's got uh, three pads that go onto the printed circuit board, bust it completely off. So what do I do? Well, as Al well knows, you know, uh, back in the cave days when I bought this, 
I went and I read the schematics on the wall, and it said, uh, well, you need to solder it back. So I did just that. And then I took my father's uh, uh, jeweler's loop. He was a watchmaker. And I figured I'd make sure I got the soldering done right because these circuit boards are all soldered together. You can't break in connectors apart, so you got to be super careful. I better make sure it's good before I put it back together. And I looked, and to my horror and shock, I found each one of those legs has a surface mount resistor on it. And I soldered it with a baseball bat. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, it does work. Uh, and this is the, the one of the two I have. I bought one at a ham fest where the cassette deck is a little trashy in it, and that one works also. So this is kind of nice. Uh, it's on 40 meters right now, but you have FM, middle wave, long wave, short wave. And that's, uh, I don't think we can get 1250 from here, but if you want to get something, you push frequency, enter, turn off the BFO. It's almost got WABC. Yeah, the, the furrowed antenna in here is actually pretty good. And another cool feature it has, um, it does have a light, which is good. It has a clock. It takes uh, three double A's in the back to maintain your clock. And this is running on uh, Enna loops with uh, D-cell adapters right now. But what I liked about it is they gave you a little stand, and of course your little time zone thing, that's what sells the radio. So you can lay it back, and if you do that, you wonder what you're going to do with the antenna. Well, Sanji Ann thought of that. You pop the antenna out and then come forward. And it's a pretty long one, too. As far as the receiver goes, it's all right off the whip. And I had it on my 30-foot uh, or 35-foot whatever uh, shortwave antenna that I use on the telescoping pole. It holds its own. I wouldn't say it's the most fa fantabulous receiver you'll ever find. But what is cool is you can pop a cassette in here and record off the air. Nowadays, that's kind of a novelty, but um, it's still a lot of, just a lot of fun to operate. And uh, I finally got it out of mothballs and refurbished it. And uh, God bless the NJARC from hanging out with all of you wonderful, awesome, incredibly smart individuals. I'm starting to learn how to fix my own instead of come and annoy somebody. And so, you know, uh, this, 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 this isn't in there anymore. What, what do you think? Well, maybe I'll take a look at it for you, you know, because you guys are busy enough. But anyway, it's also very satisfying when you get done with it. You don't have any extra screws left over. You put the batteries in, and nothing blows up. So there we go. Thank you very much. I have a uh, hint in the kink and a show and tell. Uh, a few years ago, I had a TV, and my wife kept complaining the remote wasn't working change the batteries, whatever, and I had no idea if it was working or not. Now, all these remotes operate off infrared. So in my never-ending pile of crap, I found an infrared photodiode. And initially, I just soldered it in an LED on top of a 9-volt battery, and that finally leaked after about 15 years. So I built it into a little box. So I just have a 9-volt battery, LED, current limiting resistor, and a photodiode. And if I take my insignia remote and hold it in front of the photodiode. Oh, there you go. So, of course, so you can tell if it's working. And the other thing I noticed, and it does work, um, I think with Sony, when I had an old Sony TV, they actually gave you waveforms that you should see. And I found if you take a scope and put it across the LED, I can actually see the waveforms of the pulses. And even though they all look like they're the same type of flash, the pulses are different. So, and a little, this one I put inside of a box. That's it. Okay, uh, show and tell. I picked this up off eBay a few years ago. And, oh, shit. <laughs> Had the paperwork on it. Uh, it's a Soviet receiver. Um, it says right in front here, CCCP, and all the, all the markings are in Cyrillic. So I went to our local Cyrillic translation person, Jim Duran, and I sent him a picture of it, and he gave me some quick information. It was supposed to arrange for a phone call. And um, 1985, and it's a um, Misha or something. I forget this 
translates to 003, and it is listed on Radio Museum as a professional receiver for broadcast studios. It does cover what looks like, uh, you know, broadcast band up to about 30 megahertz. And unfortunately, from what I've been able to gather inside, it's all chock full of germanium transistors. And the date in Radio Museum is 1982. So I guess the Ruskies were still using germanium in 82. All the connectors in the back are different antenna connectors. And it does work off 278 volts. And I'm, I'm wondering if they had, somebody had splice, I cut this off just to get it here today. This is like number 22 gauge zip cord, so I don't know if anybody ever used this. But I got it off eBay. The radio was like $75. <laughs> Shipping was 80. <laughs> it came, from, it actually came from, um, I think it was Poland. A guy in Poland was selling it. And it had shipped to me, and I uh, haven't played with it yet. I haven't been able to find a, a diagram. Uh, there's a website called Electrotania, yeah. and they have a lot of uh, exotic schematics, so hopefully I can get it there. But um, so far, the only information I've been able to find on it is Radio Museum. So it'll be a nice project to see if we can get it working. If nothing else for the novelty of it. What did you say the voltage is operating? It says... <laughs> 220. I was at the 27B, I don't know what the hell that is. But it does say uh, 220. 220, and a fuse is a quarter amp fuse. And it says 50 to 60 cycles, hertz. Eight ohm speaker. And these are what look like antenna jacks. They look like um, inside out reverse Motorola jacks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so. Be interesting. It's all written in, you know, it's like it's Cyrillic. So I was supposed to have talk to Jim today on it, but I got busy. So maybe tomorrow I'll speak to him. And he's going to run over the. Uh, the opened it up, I opened it up, and but, but you can tell what a germanium transistor looks like. <laughs> looks like a germanium transistor, and it's got about 30 transistors inside. So it might be, you know. Is it printed circuit? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I should have taken the covers off. I didn't. Sorry. But that's it. You look at the box and it says Kroger on it, and it's like, what's Kroger? That's a big store that's down south. When I first saw it, I said, what's K. Roger? You know, but <laughs> anyway. Cigar? Tubes. Ooh. Okay, what I have here is just a regular Loctal tube, right? And if you remember, for those who dwell in older radios, Loctal was made by Sylvania. RCA came out with miniature tubes, what, the seven pin, I guess, back in 1939, thereabouts. The Loctals were made so they would lock into the socket, and for cars and for airplanes and trains, the tube wouldn't vibrate out of the, out of the socket. So what I have here, RCA sold Loctals, but they were made by Sylvania. But, oh God, about 40 years ago, I was at an estate sale, and this fellow worked for RCA, and he had, looks like experimental tubes that RCA was trying to make Loctals, and you can see they're different. And so I have that here if you guys want to take a look at it. And also here is a 25L6 that looks, it's RCA, it looks like it was either pulled from a uh, production line and tested or it was an experimental, I don't know if they were making changes to it, but it has writing on it, on the top what it was, and I have several of these tubes and a, and a piece of paper that was taped to the envelope to identify what they were doing, the testing. Unfortunately, the gentleman that had this was long gone, so I don't have any other information. I thought maybe you guys would, would know, but... Anyway, you can take a look at that. Now, what year did the first cathedral radio come out? Anybody know? 31. 31, we figure Philco, the obligatory. No. So Wil Wilcox Laboratory Radio, and what it says on the front is cathedral. <laughs> so... 
and it shows a cathedral. So. <laughs> Well, it's got a cathedral-shaped dial. It's yeah. Um, it's, it's just a metal early AC radio. I have seen only one other radio similar to it where it was identical except for the dial, and it didn't have the cathedral name on it. And um, sorry about the mess here. I'll clean it. Wilcox. Wilcox Labs. Yeah, Wilcox Labs cathedral radio. But and you have to come out and look at it. The, the the tuning capacitors are very interesting on it. It's not your normal capacitors. They actually mesh together on the same lateral plane. It's not like it's on a shaft and meshes. So let's see if we yeah, they work just fine. But they just go in and out of each other. So that other uh I believe it's a TRF. So it's, and it still looks in good shape for being where it was stored, which was uh, not the greatest, but that's that's part of it. I, I couldn't find this thing, and finally I was cleaning up and said, oh, there it is. So I thought you'd get a kick out of it, and I brought it in. Do you know where you picked it up? It was in Texas. Um, I, some radios I remember exactly where I got them, and this one I do not. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It has uh, Wilcox uh, Laboratories Inc. on top. Um, Michigan. Looking at the tube complement, 80, 26, 24, 71s, about 27, 28, 29. Um, I can't read upside down. It's uh, Charlotte, Mich Michigan, this is from. So it's really unusual. If I would have known we were going to bring that book in on uh, the war, I do have a 1939 Menda German radio I brought back in 1992, a fellow gave me, and it's even damaged from when the house was hit by a bomb. And it has all the original paperwork with it, still has the paper hanging over it from when it was new. So, and the fellow cautioned me, he says, it hasn't run in years, so don't plug it in. I said, don't worry, I'm not, I'm going to leave it original. But uh, maybe next time we have this, I'll bring that. So anyway, that, that's what I have, and I thought you might get a kick out of that. So. This isn't anything all that super exciting or technical, but uh, this is the hints and kinks thing. So uh, <laughs> these are something you can get at Dollar Tree. They're dental picks. And they look kind of like uh, bottle brushes or, or pipe cleaners or whatever. And there's two different kinds. There's some that are like little rubber tips, and there's some that look more like the little hairy bottle cleaners. And what I just, they're for tube cleaning, cleaning the pins out of like uh, miniature, miniature pin sockets and stuff. So if you're going through something and that's intermittent, you, just, you can actually stick those in the red straw of the deoxic can and get it wet and then just go in there and, and jam through it. And they're not, they're fiber, so they're not gonna make any more shorts or it's not like, you know, hairs from like Brillo pads or anything like that. So I throw a few of them in my toolbox and they don't last very long. The, the little bristles will break off and stuff. I don't know if the deoxid's helping with that, but uh, again, dollar store. So they're cheap, throw them in your, t uh, dollar 25, yeah. Well, we have a show and tell. It's always fun to bring your latest acquisition. So thanks to um, Jim Duran was at a uh, uh, estate sale, and I got, I got this guy. And he had, a, he had a knob missing, which I took off another derelict S38. So a little, little quick rundown on the, S, the famous Halicrafters S38 series. This was a, a basic entry level. This was their entry level radios after the war. This is 1946. Um, it's basically, it's described in the, in the Moore book on communications receivers, it's basically a repackaged Echophone EC1, which was their World War II, the one with that soldier, what was his, I forget his, his name, um, yeah, Hogarth. Bo Hogarth. Hogarth. Yeah. and you know, they would, you know all, the, all the girls, all the, you know, the girls in the skirts in the South Pacific would be gathered around because he'd had this Echophone uh, 
receiver. So they went through um, Halicrafters as they did, milked it for all it was worth. And so this is the original S38, 1946, 47. And then there was S38, A, B, and C, which pretty much looked like this. Um, with some minor, some minor changes. They did do a little cost cutting. This is the only one that has a real BFO in it. They took the BFO out and they faked it on the later models with a uh, oscillating IF stage. So, th so they took the, uh, the BFO is out, is not in the S38, A, B, and C. So the 38A ran from about 46 to 47, the B from about 47 to 52. One of the interesting things about the B is it has asbestos on its bottom cover. Thanks, Halicrafters. Yeah. Don't know what that was for. S38C has a gray cabinet, but it pretty much looks like this. Again, this, they took off the noise limiter switch, wherever that went, it's here somewhere. There it is, no. Noise limiter, noise limiter, here. They, they, they eliminated that and they eliminated the front panel um, BFO control. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, finally about 1954, they finally restyled the thing. This is at S38D, they went to a slide rule dial, still pretty much the same thing inside. Um, and then that was from 54 to 57, approximately. Then from 57 to 61, they went, they, they restyled it again. This is an S38E. This is the last of the series. This is the only one with miniature tubes. They finally went to a miniature um, AA5 configuration. I, I left the uh, bottom cover off so you could all take a look at this, this masterpiece. And uh, it's untouched inside. The, uh, the cord was in pretty sad shape, so I cut that off and I used the Johnny Tronics UL approved cord with the two alligator clips on it to test it out. I also left off the back cover, so if you want to come take a look. Six tubes, pretty much an AA5 or AA6, but with some short wave bands and, and band spread. And uh, many uh, young people, you know, this was, their, this was their first radio. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you here. Was uh, there a faux wood? Oh, yeah, there was... Um, was that was that the S120 they they made the wooden one? No, the S38 came in an EB and an EM. That's right. EB that's was right. blonde e and was mahogany. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was a. Uh, they got they got cute later on. And then they, and you, you you may be familiar with the follow up set was the S120 where they took out their the big change there was they took out the rectifier tube and put in a selenium rectifier. And some of those were made in Japan. At least the guts were. I think the cabinets were made here, but the guts were mostly Japanese. And, so, you know, that's... Oh, the isolation? They, they, they went through... Uh, it's, it is a hot chassis. That's a, thank you, Rich. I forgot that's what, something I forgot to write down. So they went through all this hocus-pocus. They, they tried to insulate these, uh, these little decks that have the switches, and they've got uh, grommets to insulate the chassis from the uh, cabinet. They were about as successful as the Russians were with their paper isolation, I think. I don't know. It wasn't really... Um, well, it probably worked for about six months. Yeah, it was, it was, good. It was good for a while. Yeah, the, 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 it's, it is sort of... They sort of jumped through hoops trying to insulate the uh, chassis from the cabinet because they are ACDC sets. And... and, uh, and uh, I heard somebody yawn, so I guess that's it. <laughs> Well, I, 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 think they're, I think they're a lot of fun. Yeah, and you know, that's sort of like every one of us has one of those. I mean, you yeah. should have one. Well, the, it's a lot of performance for $29. Yes. It, 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 the, the thing is, and it, it, the, the original 38s are hard to find in nice condition. I don't know if it's because they pass through a lot of Johnny novices, you know, a lot of hands and, and uh, whatever. This one, in fact, has some minor corrosion issues, but it's... It's not that bad, but it's it's kind of dirty. I didn't buy. Like I said, it was missing its uh, yeah, the on-off knob. So I had I had another one that I got at the J and D auction, which has like, some mystery holes in the top. I don't know what why people do that, but oh, there's nothing there for me to tell you. Okay, I think that's it. Very good. All right, so that seems to uh, yeah. have filled up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always interesting, isn't it? You know, yeah. what comes it's out, really it's amazing. Show and yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, real, I realized we hadn't had one in quite a while. Yeah. So it's always good to have. Um, 
just reminds us of what we do and what we have. That's great. What was junk? Uh, J-U-Q-A-D. Okay. Um, so I want to thank our DX membership out there, okay, and our Canadian friends, um, just to let you know, we blew the smoke back to you. <laughs> All right, and we hope not to see it uh, again for a long time. All right, so uh, our next meeting uh, is here at uh, Bowen Hall, and um, I believe we scheduled Ray Chase and Harry Clancer where they take radio on the road, and he... Uh, Ray reminded me that, you know, a lot of guys have never seen what we do when we go out to the old age centers or to uh, libraries and things, and, uh, you know, why don't we just show it right here? And I said, great, great idea. So that's what we're going to do next, uh, next month. Okay, so thanks for coming. Safe home, and take your junk with you, please. Don't leave anything here. And look out for the mice, John. They're going to be running out of that box. <laughs>